Welcome to today's webinar titled The Raw Milk Movement, How M. Bovis is Making a Comeback in the United States, sponsored by the Southeastern National TB Center. Today's presenters are Dr. Carlos Risco and Dr. Connie Haley. Our first presenter is Dr. Carlos Risco. Dr. Risco is a large animal veterinarian with special training in dairy medicine. He received his DVM degree in, the, in 1980 from the University of Florida and advanced clinical training as an intern in private dairy practice at the Chino Valley Veterinary Associates in Ontario, California. He is a diplomat in the American College of Theriogenologists. Dr. Risco currently serves as a chair for the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine in Gainesville, Florida. Our second presenter is Dr. Connie Haley. Dr. Haley is an infectious disease physician and epidemiologist who currently works as a medical consultant for the Southeastern National TB Center. Dr. Haley received her medical training and Master's of Public Health degree from Vanderbilt University. She has a long history of working in the TB field, including being medical director of the Tuberculosis Elimination Program at the Tennessee Department of Health. She also served as the director of tuberculosis research for TDOH and was the principal investigator for the Tennessee site of the TB Epidemiology Studies Consortium, collaborating closely with the CDC and academic and public health partners across the U.S. and Canada. Now I'll turn this over to Dr. Risco to start today's presentation. Well, good morning, everyone, and certainly it's my pleasure to <clears throat> participate in this webinar along with uh, Dr. Haley. And my topic um, in the webinar is to discuss with you the role of the veterinary profession and the USDA in providing a wholesome uh, milk product. So milk and other dairy products are important components of the American diet. However, milk can be a vehicle for the transmission of numerous bacteria that affect human health if not properly processed. And what we have to remember is that milk can be contaminated at any stage in the production to consumption continuum. So to provide the highest quality product, uh, that is a wholesome quality product to the public, um, the pasteurization milk ordinance of 2005 has been in place, <clears throat> and this is through the United States Department of Health and Public uh, public health and the FDA, which provide standardized guidelines, guidelines relating to milk parlor and processing plant design, milking practices, milk handling, sanitation, and of course, standards for the pasteurization of grade A milk products. So my objectives this morning are to discuss with you the origin of potential milk contamination and zoonotic disease transmission zoonotic diseases, I'm referring to those diseases that can be transmitted from animal to human, and in this case, specifically would be uh, from cattle. Also, uh, dairy cattle milking procedures and processing, and then what is pasteurization and its role to control the zoonotic diseases from milk. So a good place to start, I think, is to visit the origin of milk contamination with bacteria, or the potential for contamination of milk with bacteria. And there's two sources, inclusion of bacteria during the milking uh, procedure or systematic disease. So in the inclusion of bacteria during milking, we refer to commensal bacteria. These are bacteria that are commonly found in the skin of the teeth such as Streptococcus, Bacillus, Micrococcus, Corneobacterium, and coliforms. In general, these are not harmful bacteria to, to the public, but certainly are, can be included in milk. The second one is through mastitis. So mastitis is an infection or an inflammation of the mammary gland, the udder, and uh, organisms such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus with some coliform um, that are the causative uh, bacteria for mastitis can be included in milk. 
And secondly uh, are the systemic diseases, such as uh, mycobacterium bovis such as, or tuberculosis, brucellosis, coxella burnetti, which is uh, Q fever, listeria, and mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, which is Joni's disease. So these are the most common systemic diseases that uh, cattle can, can have, and then they can transmit the, uh, this bacteria through the milk. Two points that are important to remember. Number one, that many of these bacteria in the systemic disease, the animal is asymptomatic. That means that the cow is not showing any clinical signs. So it's kind of like what we call a subclinical disease. The animal may appear healthy, however, they can uh, transmit this bacteria through the milk. And the second point, which is interesting, is that mastitis, uh, if we go back to mastitis, is general, 100% of the time, caused by either improper milking procedures or a lack of uh, environmental cleanliness. So as veterinarians and working with dairy producers, we strive to make sure that there is a clean living environment uh, for this animal and also proper milking procedures. So what approaches are there to minimize the possibility that milk contaminated with pathogenic organisms will reach the consumer? There are general, there's three in general. Enhanced animal health, improved milking hygiene, and pasteurization. So with enhanced animal health, um, because of veterinary care and diagnostic tests, many zoonotic diseases have been eliminated from the population of food producing animals. However, we must keep in mind that some infections, as I said earlier, can remain asymptomatic and could have a serious public health implication. I should point out that this risk are very low, but nevertheless, they are there. Secondly, it's improving milk hygiene. This is one of the roles that the veterinarian uh, works, the, the, the food animal veterinarian, particularly the dairy veterinarian, uh, works with the dairy producers, is to implement hygienic standards for housing and milking centers or milking parlors, cow cleanliness and disinfection prior to milking, and appropriate milking practices that reduce contamination of milk and mastitis. So pasteurization of milk. So, so pasteurization of milk is a process that was developed by Louis Pasteur in 1864 that kills harmful bacteria by heating milk to a specific temperature for a set period of time. Why is milk pasteurized? Uh, there's always the potential that raw milk that has not been pasteurized can carry bacteria that is harmful to humans, such as the ones that are listed below here, um, which, as I said, can, be, can cause numerous foodborne illnesses. So the pasteurization process for refrigerated products, so this is the milk that, uh, for example, fluid milk is an example, there's two processes. Uh, heat milk to at least 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, or high temperature short time, which is referred to as flash, which is for 161 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. And then for those products that are stored at room temperature, we use the ultra heat treatment, or the UHT, which is greater or higher temperature, 280 degrees Fahrenheit, for two seconds. So most of the products, some of, most of the milk that you buy at the store that is refrigerated, it comes from it, the, the pasteurization is this high temperature short time flash. And just as a reminder, homogenization occurs after pasteurization and breaks down fat molecules in milk so that they resist separation and without it, fat molecules will rise and form a layer of cream in the, in the, in the container. So now I'd like to discuss with you the dairy cattle milk, milking procedures and processing, basically from the farm 
to the processing plant to the store. So in general, we have uh, uh, the, you know, the role that veterinarians play, which is a major role in promoting animal health and well-being. And your picture on the left is a, a, a dairy farm, uh, which is pasture or grass-fed animal. And that's probably about 20% of the dairies in the United States. And the picture on the right are uh, dairy farms, which is what we call uh, uh, free stall housing, where the animals can go in and out of their housing. And the picture of the right is the feed trough. And I want to be clear that these animals are not permanently locked into the stanchions as you, as you see there. The purpose of those individual stanchions is, is to provide each animal a place, to, a place at the table to eat, if you will. So veterinarians, uh, through disease prevention practices such as preventive medicine, herd health, uh, disease surveillance, and treatment of sick animals following FDA guidelines, play a significant role in promoting animal health and well-being and consequently a wholesome dairy product. So uh, some of the milking procedures, so this picture, what it's showing, and this is typical in all dairies, is what we call the wash pen. So the animals, when they come in from their pasture or, or they come in from their individual uh, housing, they are washed and what you see here are very gentle uh, lawn sprinklers, sprinklers, if you will. And water in these sprinklers has a low concentration of a hypochlorite or an iodine solution and basically is to wash the udder and the teat of the cow so that when they enter the milk par parlor and are milked, the, uh, the teat is clean, as disinfected, so what you see here is the milking parlor. This is normally referred to as a herringbone design. And uh, the, the cows uh, are, um, I'm trying, just trying to get the, well, anyway, perhaps you can see it here on the, I'm just trying to get my pointer here, sorry. Um, here we go. So the cows uh, come in into, <clears throat> into this parlor. Um, anyway, they come into the parlor, and the first thing that happens is that they're dried. Okay, the teats are dried. Um, and then they are uh, what we call pre-dipping with a small iodine concentration. The, the, uh, the residue is wiped off, and then this automated milking machine are attached to the cow and they're automatically milked. This is a, a, a very sophisticated machine that they can gauge the pressure of milk in the individual uh, quarters of the udder to milk the cow. And then they, um, uh, after milking, the cow is uh, post-dipped with, uh, with the iodine uh, solution to prevent mastitis. The milk from the cow then travels to a refrigerated bulk tank where the milk is cooled to 45 degrees Fahrenheit within two hours of milking. And the purpose for this is to keep milk cold so that what we call this uh, psychotrophic or cold-loving bacteria do not grow. And then a sample is taken by the truck driver prior to pumping the milk to the truck during pickup at the farm that will take the milk to the processing plant. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the, the tools that veterinarians use is this bulk tank milk analysis, which is used for evaluate milk quality and monitoring udder health and mastitis status in a dairy farm. So what you see here is a form uh, of the type of bacteria that we evaluate from all of the dairies that uh, uh, the, the veterinarian works with. And basically, we break it down into contagious bacteria that can cause mastitis, environmental bacteria that can cause mastitis. And then we do this milk quality test, and you can read below, it's lab pasteurized count, and that what that tells us is the thermoduric. These are the, the, the heat-loving bacteria 
And if they increase, what it reflects is that we're having a, a washing problem of the equipment. We evaluate somatic cell counts, which evaluate, uh, determines the level of mastitis in the, in the herd, and standard plate counts. And we use these samples to monitor to see where we are in the, 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 the other health status of the farm. And this picture is a milk truck. You probably see them uh, up and down the highways. These are refrigerated milk trucks. And I should point out that the, uh, the truck driver is really a health inspector. And this individual, as I said earlier, takes a milk sample from each farm prior to pickup, or, or at least a sample from the bulk tank, and then the driver takes the, 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 the contents or the, the load to the milk processing plant. So at the plant, each load is tested for antibiotic residues. These are federally regulated uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, if there's regulatory action taken against the farm with a positive antibiotic test, uh, positive antibiotic tests are rare and account for far less than 1% of the tank loads of milk delivered to the processing plants, according to the CDC 2013. The point is that every load, every milk load from every farm in the United States because of federal regulation, before that milk is processed, in other words, it's pasteurized, homogenized, and then bottled, uh, it's tested for antibiotics. And if only negative uh, samples or negative uh, uh, milk is then further processed. Milk at the plant is stored at least uh, at less than 45 degrees Fahrenheit and processed within 24 hours. So the picture on the on the right is actually the pasteur the pasteurization uh, equipment, and then the picture on the left is the homogenization equipment. And then the milk is the picture on the left is the milk is uh, bottled, if you will. We know that in most most dairy or most uh, milk is either in cartons or in plastic jugs and then it's taken to the store where consumers can purchase it. So what are some alternatives to pasteurization? Well, one is boiling, and we can boil the milk. Uh, milk boils a little bit higher than water, so it's about 212 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and basically it serves the same purpose as pasteurization. Uh, you should boil milk for at least for five minutes or so, Okay, so that's an alternative. Uh, a question that always comes up is why don't we test individual milk samples specifically for, for bacteria such as M. bovis and others? Well, we have to remember that there are, this is limited by assay sensitivity. So the sensitivity of the assay to test that bacteria, both from the sampling collection strategy and the microbiological analysis. And also, this is complicated by factors such as that milk contamination occurs sporadically, contamination may not be evenly distributed, and even extremely small amounts can be infectious. So I would like to now segue a little bit into uh, Dr. Haley's presentation, uh, at least from the veterinary perspective for uh, M. bovis or bovine tuberculosis. And when are animals tested? Uh, those that are suspected for bovine TV, participation in a show or exhibition, change of ownership, interstate movement, and part of activities at slaughter. So the, 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 the crux, if you will, or the foundation for uh, monitoring tuberculosis in the United States is what we call slaughter check for TB pathology or lesions. Uh, these are performed by uh, inspectors or veterinarians at this uh, slaughter facility, and they, they survey for lesions. So the one on the right is a typical lesion in the lung. It's also found in lymph nodes, uh, in, the, in the mediastinal lymph nodes and lymph nodes near the, the, the throat area. And when they identify these lesions, of course, the animal is tested and the point is that there's this what we call this traceback. You see the number there, 
uh, we know the farm or the feedlot, for example, that this animal came from, and then they're traced back, and the cohorts from that farm are tested. The second one um, that uh, is commonly performed is the caudal full tuberculin test. This is a hypersensitivity of immune response, which is similar to the skin test used in humans, as you see on the right. And the picture on the left is what is the tail fold of the animal where the test is performed. If the animal is positive from the caudal full tuberculin test, then uh, we do a comparative cervical test, which is more sensitive to differentiate infection with mammalian TB versus avian TB organisms. So the avian TB organism is not pathogenic, and so this test here, this comparative cervical test, will differentiate whether it's mammalian or avian. So what is the problem of cervids, uh, particularly white-tail uh, deer? Uh, you know, I feel very comfortable in saying that uh, we have control of tuberculosis in cattle in this country, uh, but there's always, like in these diseases, there's always a risk. And uh, M. bovis is being increase increasingly detected in deer. So as far back as 1995, is the source of bovine TB cases in Wisconsin and Michigan. So these are the free Roman white-tailed deers, for example, that can interact with, with cattle. The incidence that from a survey has been as high as 1.2 to 2.4 percent. So uh, this could be a potential source of transmission of tuberculosis from deer to cattle. And I should point out that since 1997, all farm-raised cervids must be uh, TB tested similar to cattle. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And for more information, please visit the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, and the website appears below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Risco. Uh, this is Connie Haley. And if someone could just quickly send a message that they hear me, that would be great in the presenter chat. Um, that was really an excellent overview of the veterinary perspective. And I would like to pick up now with, um, thank you, Emily. I would like to pick up now with the human health perspective of uh, the risk of Imbovis uh, given the raw milk movement. So my talk will focus on trying to explain the epidemiology and zoonotic potential of Imbovis specifically. And I hope that it will help you be able to recognize clinical settings where Imbovis can be the etiologic agent causing tuberculosis, and also understand why it's important to know whether a person with tuberculosis disease is infected with Imbovis um, or with tuberculosis. I wanted to address, though, a couple of consumer misperceptions. Um, and I apologize, looks like these slides, every time we transfer from a Mac to a PC, uh, the formatting gets off a little, but um, hopefully it'll be all right. Um, so some of the misperceptions that are out there and widely circulated on the Internet um, include the concern that raw milk has superior microbiologic, nutritional, and health benefits, and also that those benefits are lost when the commercial heating measures are, are put into place. Um, there's also concern that the pasteurization process increases the risk of both disease, such as milk allergy, lactose intolerance, diabetes, um, osteoporosis, osteoporosis, and arthritis. Um, and again, the biggest concern is that by heating, the nutritional value of milk is lost. But what the, the reality is, is that, in fact, none of these things occur. And um, the heating process, the commercialized heating processes have very little effect on the digestibility or nutritional properties of milk. And the only impact really are, is related to the functional properties of milk protein um, in terms of emulsifying, water binding protein, and solubility, um, and also the impact that it might have on what's called the organoleptic profile, which is really just what you might experience via the senses with taste, sight, smell, and touch. And if any of you have boiled your own milk at home, 
you can kind of picture um, when I talk about functional properties when I'm when I'm referring to how the milk you know can clump and separate and, and that kind of thing. Um, whereas processes like the homogenization and even uh, flavoring can um, overcome a lot of those issues and it really has no impact on health. Um, there's also no evidence that supports increased risk of medical conditions from pasteurization. Um, and I wanted to show you a couple of figures from a really nice review that was looking at the risks and benefits of raw versus commercial milk. Um, the reference is at the bottom and also included um, in the list that we've attached for you. Um, this figure looks at the vitamin content of raw and heated milk in terms of percentage of the recommended daily intake um, on the consumption of one large glass of milk a day. Um, and as you can see, really, the, the um, vitamin content is about the same whether it's raw or heat treated. Um, and the only uh, vitamin that you know, seems to have a notable difference here is vitamin B12. And even that decrease between about 85% down to maybe 70% is not considered significant. Um, and, and as you know, milk is considered a very good source of vitamin B12. Um, commercial milk is considered a very good source of vitamin B12. Um, similarly, this figure shows the contribution of minerals and trace elements to the RDI. And as you can see, calcium is really the, the mineral that most people are most interested in. And even after heat treating, um, the uh, calcium um, levels remain very high, a very good nutritional value there. On the other hand, this slide demonstrates that the risk of infection is really quite real. And there's a large number of human pathogens that can be potentially encountered in raw cow milk. Um, there are pathogenic bacteria, viruses, even some parasites, and then toxins can occur. And the most common of these are Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter, as you can imagine. Um, they're very common in many types of foodborne uh, contamination of food. Um, but Invos is also on this list. And I just wanted to emphasize that pasteurization was put in place in 1938 in the United States. But before that time, about 25% of all food and waterborne disease outbreaks were related to milk infections. Um, and since pasteurization has been put in place, we have a very, very low um, percentage of food and waterborne outbreaks that are associated with milk, less than 1%. Um, brucellosis, brucellosis and tuberculosis were the most common pathogens. These have really been largely eradicated in developed countries that use pasteurization, such as the US by the processes that Dr. Risco mentioned, including the herd certification programs for infected animals or cold, and um, refrigerated bulk tanks and pasteurization. And it's interesting to note that most of the milk-borne outbreaks that are reported in the United States are occurring in states that permit the sale of raw milk. So there's some significant public health implications there. I want to talk a little more generally about tuberculosis. And I want to say again that um, even TB caused by embolus is considered TB disease and is reportable. Um, and so from a global standpoint, tuberculosis remains a very significant public health threat with substantial morbidity, mortality, and a high economic impact. In 2013, about 9 million people were reported to develop active tuberculosis, and about 1.5 million of those individuals died. So, um, there's some persistent issues, but we are making great progress um, and due to the uh, current global health efforts that we have in place, with an estimated 37 million lives being saved through the TB diagnosis and treatment measures that we have between 2000 and 2013. Um, but we do have um, many areas to continue to improve. Uh, limited resources is a major concern. There is a need for improved and more available diagnostics and treatment. And um, the issue of TB and HIV remains significant. And the concern about multidrug resistant TB, of course, is also very significant. Um, I wanted to note that when we talk about tuberculosis disease, we're really talking about disease caused by a number of organisms within the M. tuberculosis complex. Uh, the vast majority of disease is caused by M. tuberculosis. Um, probably about 98%, and in bovis, um, it contributes to a much smaller percentage, estimated around 1 to 
Uh, there's also a small contribution from um, disease developing after BHCG vaccine, because it is a live attenuated vaccine, although this is not common at all. Um, and I'll just note that BCG is developed from um, Bova strains, and so there's some similarities there that um, I'll briefly refer to in a little bit. Um, the contribution of MBOVA to the global burden of TB is not well defined. The incidence is difficult to define because many developing countries rely only on the AFD smear for diagnosis and don't have access to culture uh, where you can actually identify this uh, isolate um, and the organism, um, and they don't have access to molecular uh, diagnos diagnostics for the most part. Um, Embos is also can thought to be a much higher burden in areas where the disease is, is enzoic in cattle because they don't have the uh, control measures that Dr. Risco outlined um, as well established, and they are also not widely using pasteurization. Um, and it's considered transmissible between animals and humans. But there's really a concern because one estimate in Africa suggests that 80% of that population coexist very closely with cattle. With cattle in areas where there's not organized control of bovine TB, and um, those same areas also have a very high prevalence of HIV, and so that adds to the potential risk of developing and spreading bovine TB. Um, additionally, some strains that have been shown to be multi-drug resistant um, have been reported as causing human disease, both in just sporadic cases as well as um, outbreaks. Um, and these slides just provide some examples of how closely animals and humans um, interact on a day-to-day -day basis in many parts of the world. And so that contact increases the risk of spreading diseases even other than in, uh, in bovis. I want to make sure I don't give you the impression that tuberculosis as a whole is, um, is having a comeback in the United States. It does remain a persistent problem. And as you can see from this slide, looking at reported TB cases in the United States between 1982 and 2013, uh, there has been great improvement over the last few decades with um, a change from 25,000 cases a year about 20, 25 years ago to less than 10,000 cases being reported now. However, we, we would really like to see a much more substantial rate of decline, and we still have problem areas. Um, one thing that's important to notice is that while we are improving overall, the pattern of TB incidence is changing, and it's becoming more concentrated among foreign-born persons. And in 2013, about 65% of reported cases um, were among persons born outside of the United States, often in areas where um, bovine TB is more common. Also, immigrants um, coming into the United States are often infected with MTD or MBOVIS in regions where um, it's much more common, and so they can reactivate once they've arrived in the United States. Um, and it's really important to note that most labs will not identify which organism a patient has beyond um, telling you that a patient has MTD complex. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the ways that we distinguish these two in a little bit, um, but one, one of those measures is genotyping, and CDC has in place a national genotyping service that um, basically provide genotype, universal genotyping data on all culture positive isolates reported in the United States. And the data from our most recent um, reporting year, 2013, indicated that about 1.6% of culture positive patients had a genotype that was consistent within BOGA. So that gives us a, uh, the understanding that it's really a low problem overall in the United States. Um, but again, most of those were among the foreign born. And so there's certain populations where we really need to uh, think about MBOVIS. Um, and several reports have indicated that while overall the rate of MBOVIS is fairly low in the United States, it can be much more higher. It can be much higher in certain um, geographic areas, and many of those along the border, in particular, um, probably have a higher incidence of MBOVIS being due to uh, causing TB. Um, and in fact, one evaluation that um, hit all the TB isolates in San Diego um, between 2001 and 2005 found that 10% of cultures were due to MBOVIS. 
and 54% uh, of um, cultures from children were due to MBOVIS versus only 8% for adults. So that shows you that in, in areas along the border where there's a high population of individuals who either, either move from um, Mexico or travel back and forth or might um, be using dairy products um, from Mexico that are unpasteurized, this can be a big problem. But it's also a problem beyond the border states. Um, and that was shown in an outbreak of 35 cases of human embobus that occurred um, in New York City between 2001 and 2004. And this was um, found to be associated with consumption of queso fresco, or fresh cheese, that was imported from Mexico and it had not been pasteurized. So in terms of transmission, I wanted to um, describe the way that embodies can be transmitted um, from uh, animals to humans. Um, and that is through the foodborne route, which is the most common. We've been talking about that quite a bit, so I won't go into it anymore at the moment. Um, and also through airborne with contaminated aerosols, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it also can be spread through direct inoculation, um, typically causing cutaneous diseases, such as a butcher's wart. And it typically occurs when um, humans have interaction with cattle, bison, cervids, or other animals that are infected with embobus um, or with the products from these animals, such as their hives, their milk, or their meat. And occupations that will be more at risk for this would be ranching, dairy farming, working in a slaughterhouse, or as a butcher, and hunting. Um, it's also possible to get embobus BCG through immunotherapy where the BCG vaccine is used um, to uh, uh, treat certain types of cancer, such as bladder cancer and melanoma. And in terms of bladder cancer, the BCG is distilled directly into the bladder, causes an immunologic reaction, um, and that can that's typically local and help fight the cancer. But um, on rare occasions, it ends up disseminating and causing active tuberculosis. So that's um, sort of another topic, but I wanted to just raise your awareness of that issue. Um, as I mentioned, embovis can survive in raw milk and in cheese, and the risk of dairy products being brought into the United States is a real one. Um, sometimes these products are brought in for personal use, but they can also be more broadly distributed. And in that case, they would bypass any FDA or USDA regulations and inspections. And all of those great procedures that Dr. Risco described that have been put in place to protect our food, um, those are basically bypassed. Um, so the embodus does persist both in dairy herds as well as in beef cattle that are destined for the United States, particularly for Mexico. And one study from 2000 in the Peritano uh, area of Mexico found that an estimated 17% um, of 1,200 carcasses that were inspected by veterinarians had TB lesions and had to be condemned. And embodus grew out of the majority of those. Um, also, another report indicated that about 30% of the 7 million liters of milk that are produced in Mexico remain unpasteurized. And so you can imagine those products um, you know, enter the United States and then it can cause disease in people here here, but also cause disease among people living in those countries who can then reactivate from latent infection to active TB after they've arrived in the United States. So airborne transmission has been somewhat of a controversial topic. and um, it is thought that transmission between animals can occur mainly by inhalation of contaminated aerosols. They have their nose close together as they graze and feed um, and secrete excretions that can then be inhaled. Um, and human-to-human -human transmission has been considered more infrequent. Um, it has been reported, and um, typically more often has been reported among immunosuppressed populations, specifically those with HIV. And, and the magnitude of the risk from respiratory transmission is therefore really not very clear. Um, there was one study in 2007 um, that really seemed to provide the best um, indication that human-to-human -human transmission may have occurred via the respiratory route. And that involved a cluster of six patients who had TB identified as being caused by embobus. These were all fairly young individuals who were born and living in the United Kingdom. And they had very clearly documented social links to each other um, within this cluster. Four of these individuals did have risk factors for TB infection um, that typically affect the immunity, such as high dose use of steroids, alcohol misuse, diabetes, and HIV infection. 
but only one of these had a history of a true zoonotic exposure and consumption of unpasteurized dairy products. On the other hand, some of them had pulmonary disease, and so it really seemed very plausible that transmission could have occurred in this setting. Um, but what was really very, um, very uh, suggestive of transmission was that all of these isolates were identical at genotyping. And as many of you know, genotyping, um, when you have an identical genotype, it, it typically indica indicates recent transmission um, between two individuals. And it doesn't tell you the direction who infected who, but it typically indicates that two individuals were infected um, from the same source. And in this situation, it, it appeared to be pulmonary. Um, in terms of clinical manifestation of Mbova, not all Mbova infections progress to clinical disease, and you may have no symptoms. And so just as in tuberculosis causes latent TB infection, the same occurs with Mbova. Um, and for tuberculosis infection, we typically test with the skin test and the eye grid. Um, and uh, it's important to note that neither of these tests can distinguish whether or not a patient has Mbova or in tuberculosis. Um, pathogenic Mbova strains also secrete the EFAC6, TFC10, and TB7.7 um, antigens that are identified with the um, interferon gamma release assays, and that's the reason that they can't be distinguished. Um, but of note, the reason the IGROs are very useful in identifying people with infection versus people who've had BCG vaccination is that the Mbova BCG strains do not contain those antigens. It's also um, really important to know that Mbovis is clinically, radiographically, and pathologically indistinguishable from infection with tuberculosis in humans. So again, TB is, is TB, um, and needs to be addressed that way. But it has been documented that there seems to be a much higher proportion of extra pulmonary disease, either with or without pulmonary, um, occurring at the same time in these patients. And here's just some examples of uh, pulmonary lesions that have been reported, TB of the tongue, um, lupus vulgaris caused by Mbovis, which is very unusual. And then this is a cutaneous TB um, that was caused by an Mbovis exposure in a veterinarian um, who worked with an infected alpaca. Um, so I wanted to use a question to sort of um, launch the next part of my talk. And so I want to um, get you all to answer a polling question. I believe the question is over to your right. Um, and here's the question. I need to know if my patient has M tuberculosis because, OK, wait a second, um, it doesn't matter. And though this and M tuberculosis are treated with standard therapy of using the standard four drugs, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, the second option is that M bovis disease is not as serious as M tuberculosis, so I don't have to monitor them as closely. And I think that it meant serious uh, and not satellite radio serious, is that spelling looks, so um, sorry about that. And the third option is my public health investigation might be different. And then your last choice is that I will have to treat my infected contacts with a different LTBI regimen. Um, I think we've still got a few coming in. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead, Steve, thank you. And, and since we've got a very large preponderance of people having chosen um, the third option, that my public health investigation may be different. Um, and I want to tell you that's a great choice. I will address the others with some of my remaining slides, but I will agree that that is a good choice because as we've talked, your investigation will not only involve evaluating whether or not someone has pulmonary disease, and each person, even with Mbovis, should be evaluated for their potential risk of transmitting it to other contacts through a respiratory route. But your public health investigation in someone with Mbovis is really going to need to look at whether or not they've also had exposure to unpasteurized dairy products, um, and if they've got any other animal risk factors where they could have had a zoonotic exposure. And so um, that's a great one. I will also just briefly tell you that number four um, in terms of how you address infected contacts, um, it's really not um, infection, even with Mbovis, can still be treated using an INH regimen of nine months, or also with four months of rifampin, um, or with the 3HP um, three months of INH and rifampin regimens. And you'll see why in just a moment. 
Um, and answers one and two, we'll get to you. Um, so great job, everybody. So I wanted to tell you first how um, embovis can be distinguished from M. tuberculosis. So standard culture that's now used in most labs, which is including Lowenstein, Jensen, typically um, are not uh, is useful for distinguishing embovis. Um, the growth is, really requires an egg media containing pyruvate um, or other rich semi-synthetic liquid media systems. Um, and it can also take longer to grow. And so um, that's less useful. And you typically won't get your diagnosis at the point of care through that method. Genetic probes are being developed. I don't believe they're widely available yet, but a rapid probe that can be used on liquid culture growth um, can be very useful because, again, it's needed at the point of care so that you know with your patient um, how, to, how to evaluate and treat them at that time. Um, uh, it's also important to note that most embovis isolates have intrinsic resistance to pyrazinamide. And so when you get your culture susceptibility results back, which may not be until about four to six weeks after uh, your patient um, is initially considered to have TB, you may see that PNC mutation exists um, or that the susceptibility is reported as resistant to PVA. And this is an indicator that you might have in bovis. I want to point out that not all resistance is due to in bovis, and so it's not um, definitive, but it'll help you thinking in that to think in that direction. Um, but newer DNA fingerprinting techniques are really becoming more and more useful um, in spolipotyping, and the mirror VNTR um, are particularly helpful and um, can, as again I mentioned, are being done universally through the CDC uh, National Gene Typing Database. It's provided free to um, all public health labs, um, and I think most programs are aware of this. Um, but that does tell you whether or not you have embovis, but unfortunately those results are typically quite delayed from the point of diagnosis, and so they may not be all that helpful clinically at the time when you might need to know that information. Um, and then whole genome sequencing is going to be very useful, and this is becoming more and more um, available and developed. Um, but at the moment, um, the best way to get a rapid diagnosis of this is probably to contact your lab and ask if that can be done there. And if not, reference labs such as TDC, um, and National Jewish, and perhaps other large centers can um, just do the genetic probes and distinguish these organisms. Um, so a little more about why this matters. Uh, there was a study evaluating TB from uh, due to embovis infection by national communities in the United States. This was a retrospective analysis of TBK surveillance data between 1994 and 2005 in San Diego. And it found that embovis accounted for a really high proportion of culture-positive disease in children, about 45 percent, and then also a fairly high proportion in adult cases, um, higher than the national level, of, we said, was about 1.5 percent. What was also notable, though, was that in both this incident, appeared to be increasing in that area. And again, um, close contact with, um, with Mexico there, a lot of back and forth movement, and probably transfer of unpasteurized dairy products um, as well as people. Um, and at the same time that in both this incident was increasing, in tuberculosis um, was decreasing. Um, in addition, most of these individuals with Invovis were of Hispanic ethnicity, but a large proportion of them were actually born in the United States. And what was really notable was that the risk of death during treatment was considered about two and a half times higher um, than persons who had tuberculosis during the same period. And those were all among adults. Um, and so, Given the um, intrinsic resistance to PVA and the fact that embovis was very common in children with positive cultures, it was presumed that embovis was also probably common in children who were not culture positive. And that's the situation with a lot of pediatric TB because these children may have posse vascularity disease, um, but they're also may have, it may be more difficult to culture TB from young children. And so given that reason, um, this this um, study recommended that um, populations where embovis is more common, such as Southern California and other Hispanic communities that have close ties to Mexico, and particularly communities where there's a large proportion consuming unpasteurized dairy products, um, that these, these 
uh, providers in these areas should really consider extending treatment to nine months for young children, even when the cultures are negative, because treatment with four drugs um, for the standard six-month therapy where you treat for two months with PVA included, and then you complete the uh, continuation phase with just INH or Fanfan or INH or Fanfan and Ethanbital, that is not sufficient when PVA can't be used. You have to extend therapy to a total of nine months and PVA cannot be included in the first two months. And so when you have embovus and you have intrinsic resistance to PVA, those patients also have to be um, treated for uh, nine months to get adequate treatment. And this may be part of what's contributing to the increased morbidity in these patients, um, but that data is not really clear yet. There's also another evaluation retrospective review using both TB registry and genotyping data in California between 2003 and 2011. This study also showed that there was an increase in TB cases attributable to embovis during that time. While it was a small proportion of about 2% that increased, it was significantly, statistically significant. And this disease also, this study also found that embovis accounted for a high proportion of culture positive disease in children. Um, and it also found that patients with embovis were more likely to die during treatment than those with tuberculosis. And again, most of these adults were among adults who had concurrent immunosuppressive conditions. And so again, it really does go back to the polling question and suggest that these patients need to be evaluated and monitored um, over the entire course of therapy carefully, just as you would with an, another active TB case due to tuberculosis. Um, um, and also that treatment, again, needs to be extended to nine months when it's known that adults or children have um, known infection with embovis. So in, in conclusion, I hope that this has been helpful in helping you um, recognize that uh, embovis is indeed a significant public health concern with high potential for genomic transmission to humans. Um, heat treatment of raw dairy products does prevent transmission of human pathogens, including embovis. And, um, and even though these processes are out there and there's good public health measures that we can put in place, there's still a risk of embovis in um, patients, particularly in certain areas of the United States as described, and so embovis should be considered when you have foreign-born patients or U.S.-born um, patients in, bi in binational communities who consume raw dairy products, uh, especially when PVA resistance is detected, um, and then those individuals need to be treated for nine months. Uh, there's higher mortality, as I mentioned, and there's also a risk of MDR embovis. Hopefully, cultures will be obtained, and that can identify the susceptibility profile so that appropriate treatment can be provided. And again, I want to state this is not uh, a significant number of MDR cases that have been reported, but it's certainly there. And MDR-TB uh, due to embovis as well as um, tuberculosis is purely a human-caused problem. It, um, the drugs, inatrofampin and other drugs, are not used in the veterinary world, and so um, patients who develop NGRTB, it's, it's purely due to um, lack of adherence in those situations or inappropriate treatment. And so again, this is something we can certainly deal with public health. Um, and then last, I just wanted to say discriminating these two different isolates of the complex are very important for your epidemiologic investigation and also making sure that you put in place appropriate measures for that individual um, as well as potentially in the community that they're in. In the future, the actual incidence and impact of embovis globally really needs to be evaluated, especially where embovis is in genotic and there's significant human-to-human -human interaction and a high uh, incidence of HIV, low use of pasteurization and other bovine TB control measures. Um, global prevention strategies should be put in place, like public health education, um, regarding animal contact and ingestion of raw dairy products, um, and also working to uh, extend the processes that we use in developed countries to other areas of the world. And um, rapid identification of the species of the complex among all TB isolates at the point of care will be uh, very, very helpful if that become a universal uh, process in the future. And we'll just need to continue to collaborate both between veterinarian and medical professionals to elaborate, eradicate this disease 
as part of the One Health initiative that's really being emphasized globally. And so I think um, we've made the presentations a bit longer than we hoped, and we still have some time for questions. Um, and I uh, want to ask Casey and Dr. Risco to please join the call. We'll address some questions, and I think if it's okay, we'll continue to address questions beyond um, noon, and if anyone can stay on, that's great, and if you need to go, we completely understand. Uh, we thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Dr. Risco and Dr. Haley, for your valuable presentation. Um, it's actually noon right now, but um, we can take a couple of questions. Uh, one that we had um, seen during Dr. Risco's presentation is, uh, what are states that allow raw milk currently legally for consumption to humans? And uh, well, the only <clears throat> the only state that I'm that I'm familiar with is uh, I know that uh, California. Uh, has a particular dairy, it's called Altadena Dairy, that uh, um, allows the sale of raw milk. Uh, this is going back to the to the 70s that they've been. Okay. Then also, Dr. Risco, um, are the washing procedures uh, different on um, in the north northern U.S. versus the southern U.S.? Are there any differences? No, basically there are no differences, just the, the, depending on the weather, of course. But ba ba basically the concept is that prior to milking these cows, that they are sanitized, they're clean, um, and then the guidelines for proper milking procedures are, are standard across all dairies. Okay. Now, we also know that um, this is a reportable disease in animals. Um, some of you had questions about what to do if a human is reported, uh, such as a farmer, um, who to contact. Uh, Dr. Haley, do you have an answer to that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question for me? Sure. Um, is, the, is the disease, is M. bovis um, reportable when a human is tested positive, and who would they contact? So that's a really great question, and I um, want to make, make it clear that M. bovis tuberculosis is tuberculosis. And so um, it, will, it is certainly reportable nationally and in all states. Um, and, and most of the time when a public health department is notified that a patient has tuberculosis, they may not know that it's in bovis. And so uh, the exact same public health procedures apply. Um, it's usually later, if not after the fact, that um, in bovis is specifically identified. So it doesn't change um, any of the reporting. It just potentially changes uh, how you conduct your investigation depending on the site, your education of the patient, um, trying to help them identify how they might have acquired the disease and how and you'll manage it by making sure treatment is extended for a total of nine months because PDA will not have been effective if it had been provided. Um, and so, um, again, TB with imbovis and TB with intuberculosis are both still uh, active tuberculosis disease that's reported um, in the same way. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, one last question um, for Dr. Risco. As far as testing the milk, what specific organisms are tested? <clears throat> the organisms that are tested, um, both at the farm at the farm level and then at the pasteurized at the at the plant, are. As I said in my slide, uh, contagious or, or bacteria that cause contagious mastitis, which are uh, mastitis that occurs during the milking process. Those are mostly your streptococcus and staphylococcus uh, bacterium, and um, also mycoplasma. And then we also test uh, what we call the environmental uh, bacteria. Uh, these are mostly coliform, uh, and they cause um, environmental mastitis, meaning that the cow is, uh, it's dirty, if you will, when she comes in during the milking procedure. That's why we focus on to rule out whether the incidence of mastitis or the, incident, or the increase in bacterial contamination, is it coming from the environment or is it related to poor uh, mil milking procedures? Oh, wonderful. And um, so that, this concludes today's webinar. You'll receive a survey asking for feedback on the event. Your insights will help us to shape future events such as this. So on behalf of the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center, thank you for joining us today, and I hope everyone has a great day.
Thanks, guys.